Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, the fourth session of our inaugural IEA conference. My name is Yash, and I am an engineering student from Yale and a co-founder of the Intercollegiate Engineering Association uh, Alliance, sorry about that, or the IEA. Before I introduce our fantastic speaker, I just want to mention the question and answer session after the presentation. Please send in your questions in the live event Q&A chat section anytime during the talk, and I will pose them to Ellen on your behalf. Uh, if you would like to feel, uh, feel free to add your name and where you're from or your, or your university, uh, but if you would prefer to remain anonymous, uh, that's completely fine as well. So now I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker, Ellen Su, a fellow alumnus of Yale. Ellen is the Chief Product Officer at Wellings, a digital health company focusing on improving care for patients with chronic respiratory conditions. She previously founded a medical device startup where she raised funding, directed product, led design, and eventually managed the acquisition of her company by Wellings. Without further ado, I'll hand it over to Ellen. All right, can you hear me all right? Yep, you're good. Excellent. Awesome. Thank you for having me here, Ash. Uh, really happy to be here. And uh, I'll be today going through my story as well as the development of the previous startup, the acquisition, talking about that process, what it looked like in the early days of the startup, how we kind of grew and how the startup grew. And then especially with that acquisition process, you know, what that um, what that experience looked like from the other side uh, going into, you know, what are some of the things that we wish we knew? Uh, what are some of the things that um, we learned or really appreciated starting a startup right out of school? And what are the some of the things that we wish we had had or had known before we did that? Um, hopefully as a way to uh, help, uh, help anybody out there who's thinking about kind of an entrepreneurial journey to think through, um, you know, when that might you know if that's the right move for you when that's when you should be thinking about it and also hopefully providing a little bit more clarity on like how you get there so um to start off uh all right did the slide go properly uh it should be should be there now yep okay awesome um so we'll also talk about what it means to be successful in a startup i think there's a the the stories that are shared in the media are a very small subset of the stories of you know people that I meet and work with every day. And especially when we were starting our startup, it can be really uh, it can be really tough to figure out you know what is a realistic view for startups. And I think there's this very romanticized image of it. But then you hear statistics like 90% of startups fail and uh, a lot of them don't raise money and a lot of them don't make it off the ground. And those stories don't get shared for good reason, because, you know, people don't necessarily want to attach their names to it. But I'll talk through, you know, what were some of the ups and downs of our experience and uh, how did we tell that story in a way that kind of made sense and also in a way that um, made it so we could share that story. So uh, I will dive a little bit into myself and my background. So I'm Ellen. Um, I actually, uh, while well, I've been doing a lot of engineering and, and working with a lot of engineers, um, this is uh, me as a child, I was actually an art major. Um, I actually came into Yale wanting to be an art major um, and was thinking I was going to do fine arts and painting. Um, but I was always really good with math and, math and science as well, and I didn't want to give that up, which is why I went to, um, you know, a school that had that was really good with both. Um, and as I was in school, being an art major, uh, I realized that I wasn't cut out to be an artist. It is actually so tough to be an artist, and it takes a lot of uh, self-direction and uh, you know, kind of having a message that you want to bring out to the world. And for me, I was really all about problem solving. Um, and so I learned about human centered design when I was a sophomore and kind of had a huge like mid mid college sophomore slump crisis where I was like, what am I doing? You know, what what have I done so far in my college career? Like, is it too late for me to change? Um, and what I ended up doing was, you know, I, I ended up combining some of that arts and that engineering and uh, really creating a curriculum for myself that was focused around product design. <clears throat> and so I was taking engineering classes, but I was combining those with some of the graphic design and sculpture classes I was doing. Um, I also co-founded the Yale chapter of 
Design for America, which was meant to teach uh, teach students about design thinking by applying it to real world problems around the community. Um, and so that was actually a really big experience for me, um, kind of learning about that human centered design process. Um, it was a really great experience for, for me and for us. But one of the things that we ran into was that uh, it is really hard to coordinate people during the school year. And it's really hard to get any projects done when you're trying to wrangle you know, five or six different students with different schedules and extracurriculars. And so uh, my friend and I, who I co-founded the studio with, we always felt this um, struggle. You know, we, we felt this tension and we, we were always thinking, you know, what if? we had the time to do a project like this properly. It felt like it could be so impactful and so powerful if we just had the time to do that. So we were really, really fortunate in that the Yale Center for Engineering Innovation and Design actually opened up my senior year. Um, and I basically lived there the entire year. Um, and we, uh, we got to know the staff there real well. We were kind of some of the founding people in the space and, and spending a lot of time in the space and we got to play with all of the toys there laser cutters uh 3d printers you know all of the hand tools and power tools the machine shop so many cool things that we could do and really so many um uh, uh, ways that we could prototype things and uh, we were also really fortunate there because they just started up a summer fellowship program. And so we were actually part of the first uh, groups of students that were that had applied um, where they would basically fund students through the summer to work on an, an engineering project. Um, and so we started off with this uh, question. You know, some of the teams applied with ideas, uh, you know, things like, oh, let's build a, uh, a hybrid solid and liquid fuel rocket engine, or let's build a modular microfluidics chip. Um, we came to, or, you know, another team said, like, let's build out um, like a cell phone mesh networking system using Bluetooth and Wi Fi. Like, all very cool projects. But we applied with, we think there's a problem within scoliosis treatment. We think there's an opportunity for improvement, but we don't know what it is yet, but we'll figure it out. Um, and luckily the professors knew us well enough to say, okay, you know, this is, they don't have an idea, but we trust that they'll find one. Um, and so that was, uh, that was uh, a lucky break for us. So we ended up getting that funding. And so we were focusing on an area of scoliosis. So scoliosis is an abnormal curvature of the spine. Um, as kids are growing, the spine starts to grow curved sideways. Um, and it's typically treated with hard plastic back braces. And these the kids are told to wear the back braces up to 23 hours a day for two to four years as they're going through puberty. Um, it's a really tough time um, and it's a really kind of tough treatment to go through. Um, and so that's leading to poor compliance with the brace. Uh, and, you know, we were looking at all of that and we're like, this treatment hasn't changed in decades and there has to be a better way to do this. My And, and part of the reason we were focusing on this was that my co-founder had scoliosis when he was younger. And so we were able to kind of draw on his experience and use that as a launching point to identify a problem. And then from there, we actually started diving into research. So in that first um, in that first kind of fellowship, we spent the first six weeks of it just doing research. Like we didn't at the midpoint, you know, all these other teams were showing off their prototypes and their progress and their iterations. And we were like, here's a giant pile of sticky notes all pasted all over the walls. Like it looks like, a, you know, it looks like a, a madman you know, just sprayed sticky notes everywhere. Um, but we had a, we had gained a really deep understanding. So a um, little bit of a spoiler alert there, but I'll just go to the next phase. So there was a lot of research that we were doing. So we were reading uh, peer reviewed studies and we were reaching out to the authors of those studies to kind of understand. We had really good timing because there was, there was actually one of the largest uh, NIH funded studies in orthotics and prosthetics was finishing up right around then. And so we were able to reach out to those researchers and understand, uh, you know, what did they find in that study? And that study really conclusively proved that scoliosis braces work to prevent surgery, but also on the flip side, that kids weren't wearing the brace and that 
that was leading to higher incidence of surgery than than was really needed. Um, we also did a lot of shadowing. So we went to the Yale New Haven Spine Center. We shadowed the doctors there just to get an understanding of, you know, what does a treatment, uh, what does the treatment process look like? What does a doctor's appointment look like if you have scoliosis? We talked to the parents and the kids and, you know, we got to hear the questions that they were asking, the current concerns that they had. Um, we also went to a support group meeting um, and also ended up on the local news, which was uh, a fun experience. So we talked to um, kids and parents at the support group to really get an understanding of, you know, what is the emotional experience and what is that patient experience like of having scoliosis? Um, and what are some of the things, you know, trying to get to the root cause of why aren't kids wearing the braces? And there were a lot of different reasons and trying to tease those out and pull those out. Uh, we also talked to brace manufacturers. So we went and visited and toured brace manufacturing facilities and um, really tried to understand what that manufacturing process looked like, where, where were there areas for improvement? You know, were there ways that we could physically improve the brace to make it less uncomfortable? So we really put all of those options out there. Um, from there, we kind of generated some of these documents that were, um, you know, helping us figure out, you know, what does that progression look like? And can we create some more educational materials, both from what we synthesized and understood, but also that could uh, help out patients and parents. Um, and so we kind of created this experience flow chart and then we uh, basically put sticky notes everywhere and we, we grabbed, you know, we grabbed a whole realm of stuff. So we went everywhere from, you know, how can we improve the scoliosis screening pro process? How can we support social and emotional health? How can we uh, prevent surgery? How can we have uh, increase awareness of scoliosis? Um, how can we provide better feedback to patients? How do we improve the brace comfort or appearance? So, you know, we considered all options there. Um, and we, yeah, so you can see. Um, and then what we did from there is we drew out those insights and we really asked that question, you know, how can we improve the quality of life of people with scoliosis, which is a really broad question. And from there, we drilled down to, uh, to kind of this tree of kind of how can we statements. And so we went to, you know, how can we improve the treatment experience down to how can we make bracing a more positive and supportive experience? Um, how can we increase psychosocial health? Um, how can we provide more choice for the patients and allow them to have more agency? Um, all the way on the other side is can, how can we reduce the need for surgery? Um, and so from there, it's how do we better track curve progression? How do we increase awareness and early screening, uh, which seem to be, you know, one of the things that contributed most to early intervention. Um, how can we improve the comfort of the brace? Uh, how can we, in general, improve um, compliance and adherence to the bracing regimen? And so we kind of drove out, kind of separate out, out all of those questions. And then from all of those, we were starting to generate ideas. And so we had this whole like ideation board. And so each one of those questions, we were able to generate five or six ideas to the point where we had literally like over a hundred ideas on that board. Um, and then, you know, we had to narrow them down. We had to figure out what we wanted to do. And we were looking at, you know, what is feasible, uh, what's possible to do, what is uh, viable, um, you know, what can, what makes business sense to do, and then what is desirable and, you know, what is it that people will actually want to accept or want to use. And so kind of looking at those three intersections. Um, and what we came out with, actually, what was really funny is for about two weeks, we thought that the best thing that we could do would be to rent a van and drive around or actually buy a van, ride around the country screening kids for scoliosis in states that didn't man mandate school screenings. You know, only about half of half of states mandated school screenings. So we're like, OK, we can more cost effectively and more accurately provide school screenings and drive around because, you know, otherwise it's school nurses doing it. And so like we were all gung ho about it. It was going to be called Moby Scully and we were going to get trained and we were going to drive around and we we're going to identify kind of the population centers that needed the most help and we we're going to contact the schools. Um, and then we realized that we hadn't taken into, into account kind of the fourth rating category, which is how much do we personally want to do this? And are we the right people to do this? And we looked at each other kind of like a week into really gearing up to do Moby Scully. And we're like, do we actually want to drive around in a van around the country and do this? You know, and, and do we want to, like, are we the best people to do this? And we just kind of looked at each other and we're like, mm, nah. 
<laughs> uh, we ended up uh, deciding that that was a great idea and a great business model for someone else to do, uh, but but that we had, you know, with our skills and our interests, we should focus on something else. And so what we ended up uh, deciding on was to create a smart strap for scoliosis braces that would be able to measure how long and how tight braces were worn, provide feedback to the patients, and then share that share that information with the parents and the doctors so that everybody was on the same page and that you could kind of better track treatment progression with better data for how well people were actually following. So, you know, the process in that first summer, this was six weeks into a 10 week program and like our advisor was getting kind of anxious, but then it really quickly came together once we knew that we were working on the right thing. And once we felt confident that this is the right thing for us to work on, we've gotten feedback on it and we can really kind of go full speed ahead. Um, so it was really worth taking that time to do. So we started uh, prototyping and actually the early, early prototypes was actually just doing sketches. You know, this is, this is the part where I could actually use my, uh, what I actually learned in school uh, with the art major, but we could create those early sketches and show people and we could show the doctors because, you know, you can explain a smart strap, but if you can show someone a picture of it and have them imagine what that looks like, uh, that can be a lot more powerful and impactful. And so we were able to get really good feedback from it. You know, from here, actually, uh, one of the early pieces of feedback that we got from the kids was like, we don't want lights on it. We don't want to call attention. I don't, you know, I don't want to accidentally press a button and have, you know, have this thing light up under my shirt. And so actually for kind of a next version, um, you know, the next version was super sleek and didn't have any lights. Um, you can also see this prototype that we actually ended up with at the end of that 10 week program. <clears throat> it was a 3D printed case with an Arduino uh, running it with uh, this kind of <laughs> these super bright LED strips um, and a strain gauge that we had ripped out of a luggage scale. And so it was really like a hacked together prototype, super cheap, but it allowed us to test, uh, you know, to kind of bench test so we could pull on the strap and we could see the lights change to see like how tight was it. And then it would it would hit green when it was tight enough. Um, and then over the next year, actually, so so that's where we ended up at the end of the summer. And we had had this like really brief kind of discussion of what a business plan would look like. And, um, you know, we connected back with our with everybody that we reached out to for research, you know, those manufacturers, the doctors, the patients, um, and we're able to take that back for feedback. And so over the next year, uh, while we were kind of still in school, we were doing more prototyping. We were uh, trying to package it up to, into a standalone module so you didn't have to connect it to, a, um, to something else, making it completely battery powered. Um, we started talking to um, the Yale New Haven Health Center to run a pilot study. So we reached out to the surgeon there um, and we were able to kind of a year later create this standalone module that we could put into a pilot study with with actual patients um, and we were able to do that and you know we were able to have something that looked a lot like that initial um, that initial drawing uh, but a year later so we bought ourselves a time to kind of make that progress and get that feedback um, and so that was something that was really valuable for us was learning that process of you know what is a prototype and it doesn't have to be you know, physically circuits and, and devices and all that. It can be, it can come in a lot of different forms. Um, so that was kind of our first summer. And then after that, we applied to a business accelerator uh, and, and learned, you know, about a business model canvas, about how to identify different stakeholders and customers, um, about how to build a pitch deck. And then we also learned a lot of stuff that we didn't appreciate at the time, but then like really needed down, down the line, like accounting and finance and um, how to create a due diligence folder for investors and, uh, you know, a lot of cap table management, for example, um, managing employees, which like you don't really need to know until you have more than just the co-founders. Um, managing yourself is its own whole discipline, um, but like managing employees is a completely different skill set. Um, so yeah, so that was the 
kind of the first year was just getting getting our prototype together and and then being able to learn about it as a business. Just tying really quick into the prototype piece, around this time we were we were also uh, creating software. Um, and so we started working with some students actually to create a, an initial prototype version of our mobile app. Um, and then we got some grant funding to hire some external contract developers to help us code up the first version of the app. And so with the um, with the mobile app development, you can still go through this process where you know here you go from, from low fidelity prototype, which is just the sketch, to an actual working prototype. And uh, you know, mobile development wise, it's similar where you can go from a sketch uh, of a layout and wireframe um, all the way up to kind of a, a really simple wireframe, all the way up to something that looks like the app that you're building. And you can test that with people. Um, I interned at a software company at one point and as a UI UX designer and one of the one of the kind of best lessons that I learned from that was watching the CEO of that company take the wireframes that the designer had built and it was like these uh, kind of like this middle range where it was just like black and white boxes and labeled with the type of content that was in there. And he basically he printed out all of those sheets of paper, he cut them out into uh, into kind of the the phone size screens, and then he would go on the train actually he because he commuted every day, and so when he was on his hour long train ride he would just like ambush people and he'd be like hey can you help me user test this app really quick, and he would show them he would have this stack of of app screens and then he would be like I'm trying to create this app here's what it does, here's what you're trying to do, what would you click on next? You know, if I asked you to do this, how would you interact with this? And so someone would be like, you know, look at that screen full of gray boxes, and they'd be like, I might click on this button. And the CEO is like, okay, great. And then he would like shuffle this pages and like pull up the next page. And be like, okay, this this is the next screen that shows up. What would you do next after this? And then they would, you know, click on something and he would like go and shuffle the pages and like bring up the, like find the next screen from that. Um, super low fidelity prototyping, really, really easy. Like anybody can do that, right? You know, if you can draw boxes and they don't even have to be straight lines, like you can prototype an app really quickly. And the more and the more time you invest in getting that right, um, the better off you'll be down the line. Uh, so yeah, so that was the scoliosis side of things. Um, kind of going through that a little bit more. So that was our first year. And then the second year we were able to raise some grant funding, uh, which bought us time to actually uh, build out an initial prototype. We got in touch with a uh, well-respected researcher um, at New York Presbyterian Hospital. And so we got, um, <clears throat> we got, uh, we brought him on as our chief medical officer. Um, and so his, name kind of on our website pulled in a lot more connections and so that was one of the things that we benefited of having people who were more experienced because at a certain point you know people love talking to students and it was great and we got into a lot of places that we really shouldn't have um, just by being students and being like hey you know i'm a student here i'm trying to learn more about this i've read you know i've read your papers or you know i've watched your videos and i'm really interested to just learn how this process works and people are really willing to help you as soon as you graduate like that all disappears so fast um you know people don't want to talk to just like randos reaching out so if you've already graduated they're like well you know who are these people are they trying to sell me something like what's what's going on here so we actually kept a lot of those relationships that we made as students um and and were able to leapfrog off of that uh and you know, that was able to help us build additional relationships and get additional kind of introductions. Um, so we started developing, we started putting together a clinical study, and then we needed to make 200 devices for the clinical study. And so we started in manufacturing and man, medical device manufacturing is not fun. And this is where we went too big, too fast. We were too, uh, we were too eager to go into manufacturing and dive headfirst into it because we thought that we needed that in order to be legit. Um, and we really should have done a much smaller manufacturing run and, and not done, you know, injection molds and full kind of, uh, you know, full run of the printed circuit board and full kind of manufacturing assembly. We should have done an intermediate step where we kind of made our own injection molds and we maybe use like a turnkey place to do the um, to do the circuit boards 
uh, and assembled them ourselves um, because the injection molding process uh, that costs sixty thousand dollars upfront to get the molds made, and that's on the cheap end of the spectrum. And then we decided, oh, you know, we don't know how to do this, so we're going to work with a medical device manufacturing facility. Those folks are used to working with, you know, class three medical devices. They need clean rooms. They need to be sterilized. You know, they need all sorts of other things, um, and those end up costing you a lot of money for something that you don't need to be as rigorous as it is. Um, I mean, granted, we got a really nice product out of it. So I think, uh, so, you know, this is kind of where we ended up. It was a really nice looking product, but there, you know, we ran into trouble with it, right? We had issues with it. It wasn't, for example, we underestimated the forces. So we did actually an F uh, FMEA analysis of what the forces were like pulling on the strap. Um, and we had, okay, you know, average force is X for a scoliosis brace. Um, but then when we started putting them out into the field, we kept getting reports that the devices were breaking. And essentially, like, literally this, uh, the metal loop was kind of being pulled straight out of the plastic case and it was splitting. And what we found was that the point forces, so when someone bends down or they, like, yeah, so when someone like bent down or like did something where they had like a big twisting motion on the brace, the peak force there was much higher than we anticipated. And so like we had built in a factor of safety and we had we had built in kind of an extra for that average force. And we had actually really underestimated how much uh, how much force it really would be put under because, you know, if the peak force is super high and it breaks the case, like doesn't matter what your average force was supposed to be. <clears throat> so that was a lesson that we learned. Um, and kind of through that whole process, what ended up happening was, you know, be we were, the original intention with this was to uh, start in a small market with a really high degree of need. So with scoliosis, these surgeries are these like horrible spinal fusion surgeries where they cut open your entire back and they implant, they basically take these big titanium screws and they screw them into your spine. It's not fun. Um, and after that process, it fuses your spine. So, you know, you, your spine is really straight, but you can't twist or bend afterwards. Um, <clears throat> and that was actually my co-founder had to have the surgery. And then actually when he, a year later after he had the surgery, he ended up getting staph infection in the rods. And so he actually had to go in back in for another major surgery to get them taken out. Um, and so this is something, you know, each surgery costs about a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars, and the braces cost about two thousand dollars. And so, you know, there's a lot of wiggle room. If you can prevent the surgery by with better brace wear, then the then the cost of the strap pays for itself. But when you go to an investor and they say, okay, that's all well and good on an individual level, but like how many people actually have scoliosis? Um, and how many people have these braces and how many surgeries are there per year? because those surgeries were so expensive, like it costs about a billion dollars a year, but that was actually only about like 8,000 people a year. Uh, and so the market was way too small for them to consider. Um, and so we ended up needing to figure out like, okay, how do we message this in a way where we're, we can show that we're targeting a bigger market, but that we're really focused on success in kind of this early high return on investment market. Um, the problem was like we were because we had started with the problem of scoliosis treatment, uh, we, you know, it was hard for us to go backwards and say we have a product. Where can it fit? You know, we have this block. Let's find a hole for it versus like let's find a gap and fill it. Um, and so that actually was really difficult for us. And uh, we we spent a long time struggling to figure out, you know, what the what the uh, use case was outside of that. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, we had to convince ourselves that that was also a good business case. You know, why would someone need the strap or what does the company look like? What is, what are we really good at that we can apply to fixing the problem in another, um, in another disease state? So, I don't know that we ever figured that out. And so, you know, one of the things that happened was that with the manufacturing taking so much longer than it needed to, and not having that kind of great answer for the next market, 
um, the investors, you know, didn't want to reinvest or we couldn't pull in bigger investors. And so while we had raised a pretty good amount of funding, we ended up raising about $1.3 million uh, in funding. But a lot of that got eaten up with the prototyping and and the burn rate. So, you know, essentially, if you're open and you have employees like that money is going out the door every month just to keep the doors open. Um, so we had to make a tough call, actually, at one point. We looked at the funds we had left in the bank. We looked at what was going on. So we had the clinical study. We had the manufacturing. The manufacturing was almost done. We had a we had a patent that was just about to be granted. We had a clinical study that could start as soon as the uh, manufactured devices went out. Um, but we had to, we had to make the the funds last until then. And so we actually had to make a really tough call to go into kind of hibernation mode. Um, and so we cut our expenses down so low. We were, it was, it ended up being like a thousand dollars a month, which is almost nothing in the grand scheme of things. You know, right now, uh, the company that I'm at right now, we burn like $45,000 a month. It's actually kind of crazy. Um, and that's, that's still low. Like that's still a relatively small startup. Um, and so our expenses were almost nothing. But what that meant was that I had, you know, I, I stuck on full time, uh, pretty much unpaid. Um, Levi, my co-founder, you know, because he had student loans, he actually had to go back to grad school. Uh, he, you know, he had to he pushed it off a little bit so that he went back to grad school. And then we ended up having to help our employees actually find new jobs um, and then basically just say, like, hey, could we you know, when we get some funding in, can we borrow your time to like do bug fixes or, you know, kind of help out here and there when possible, but like we'll, we can't keep employing you, which that was the toughest thing because our software developer had, you know, he was the sole income for a family, you know, for his wife and three kids. Um, and so that was really tough. That was a really tough conversation. And so we had to make sure that we found a good place for him to land. Um, and that was the first first priority there. So we were in this low power mode for a while. And, and what we focused on was let's find someone who sees value in this amongst all of our partners uh, and who can kind of take this forward. Um, and so I spent that whole year uh, one, living off my savings, two, doing some side gigs and, and mentoring uh, through the entrepreneurship uh, environment at Yale. And then three, like going around the country, talking to, you know, O&P clinics, talking to brace manufacturers, ended up talking to a company in France that did 3D scanning for back braces and like flying out to France a couple of times, like trying to get these deals done. Um, and actually what ended up happening was a company that I had met through the entrepreneurship ecosystem in Connecticut had just raised funding and they were looking to expand their, um, they, they were a medical device company in the respiratory space and they were looking to add Bluetooth to their nebulizer, have an app that it could connect to so that you could download data and get insights, connect that data to caregivers and doctors so that everybody was on the same page with treatment and really track adherence to treatment from the patient side. And so pretty much every single piece of that was really similar to what we were working on, except for the specific device that we were connecting to. Um, and, you know, we got to talking, they were looking to pretty much bring on a team in technology to build out this kind of software side of things. And they had just closed a funding round to do that. Um, and so we ended up uh, deciding that they should acquire us. Um, and the, the, the confusing part of that is my original company was called Wellinks. The new company was called Convexi Scientific. And then once they acquired us, they also acquired the name and rebranded as Wellinks. Um, so that was fun. Um, but yeah, so they, they acquired us and then they, uh, and then I joined that team actually, uh, this all went down. The acquisition papers were signed December 30th, 2019. We had to get it done before the end of the year for tax reasons. Um, and thank goodness we did because, um, if it had gone any longer, if it had bled into January, February, March, like that deal would not have gotten done. January was definitely an interesting time to get into respiratory care and respiratory devices, especially jumping right into working with companies in China that were manufacturing the nebulizer and hearing, you know, 
hearing things from them in December and January um, and then having the factory shut down at the end of January. And, you know, we were like, OK, well, you know, unreliable. The factories are all shut down. I don't know what we're going to do. And then, you know, you know what happened next. Um, and the funny thing is, like we in in January, we bought some boxes of masks, like surgical masks to mail over to Hong Kong for our source to, to some of our uh, partners that we worked with there because they they couldn't find any masks. And then um, in March, we actually they were sharing tips on how they dealt with lockdown in China, um, and they actually ended up shipping over 2000 masks over to us. Um, and so that was, you know, that was a really good kind of partner opportunity. Um, but it was that was a lot to jump into. Um, but yeah, so I'm going to just really quickly just talk through the new company. So the new company is called Wellings. Um, we so what we focus on is actually uh, reinventing COPD care on the people who need it. And the really cool thing that we've been able to do here is expand outside of just devices and software. Um, to me, product is about solving a need and the more tools you have in your toolbox to, to solve that need, the, the more you can create something that is really impactful. So if your toolbox is just physical devices, that limits you in what you can do. If you expand that to include software, great, that, that lets you do a lot more. And what's been really exciting is that we can actually, we've been expanding out into the, that services component. So I'll talk through a little bit of that. I am going to swap over to our, investor deck, um, which is in PDF form. Uh, let's see if I can pull that up. All right, I literally just had it showing. OK, here we go. OK, cool. Can you guys? see the virtual pulmonary rehabilitation screen? Uh, yeah, it should be live now. Okay, all right, I'm gonna scroll up. Okay, so um, so yeah, so with the COPD care piece of it, um, oh, geez, okay. Okay, what do you guys see right now? I believe it should be the executive summary slide. Perfect. Okay, there we go. So, um, kind of a little bit of backstory. So, it's again, you know, here's an area where people are underserved. There's not a lot of people focusing in COPD, and it's a chronic condition. So, it's there's a long term treatment plan. <clears throat> and it typically affects folks who are 65 plus, uh, and it's the fifth most costly chronic condition and the third leading cause of death, actually. Um, so it's it's a really expensive and it's a huge problem, but you have 18,000 patients to one to every respiratory or pulmonary rehab center. And these people are uh, around rural America. So, you know, they're not getting access to care. And especially over the past year, you know, we've seen that we have to be able to deliver care at home. And even, uh, you know, if and when COVID is over, those options are still going to be critical for our patients because they are impacted by, uh, you know, they have limited mobility, they can't move about the world freely because it is so difficult to uh, just exist in the world if you can't breathe properly. Um, and, you know, there's a, these, you know, these folks need a lot of support and they're only seeing the doctor every six months. And so there's a lot of blind spots here where, and there's a lot of opportunities for things to get worse without anybody keeping an eye on it. And so what we've been doing is, you know, we've been looking at what are the ways that we can help these folks. And, and really, it's not just going to be any one thing. It's not a miracle device. It's not a miracle piece of software, especially for this patient's population. Like software is not the answer for them. Um, so it's the 
it's everything all together. It's this kind of like wraparound software and services component, um, which does make the product a lot more complicated, but it also means that the, the support we can offer is much more multidimensional. Um, and the big thing to emphasize here is looking at that human to human experience. So we had started off in devices. So we started off with this nebulizer, we added Bluetooth to it, we started connecting it to an app, we added pulse oximetry and spirometry to the app. So we were just like, okay, we'll let people take readings and then they can take those readings and and, uh, and learn about themselves based on those, and then the doctor can see them. And so we ran actually a pilot study with, a, with that premise, but we also had a clinical coordinator who was following up with patients. And one of the biggest things that we heard from that was that people loved talking to her um, and learned so much from her. And so uh, we really started focusing on that interaction and that human to human connection to help patients gain that motivation and to, to really create those action plans. And so we've been able to build out this whole coaching program, which has been really exciting. Um, you know, and it's, and it's a trend that is that we see in diabetes, behavioral, scale, uh, behavioral health and musculoskeletal health, where you have these coaches working with patients that are non-medical, but help uh, bridge that gap between those doctor visits. Um, and so, you know, we have devices, the coaching and monitoring, and, and those things come together to create a virtual pulmonary rehab program. And so that's kind of like the, the secret sauce of it. So we've got devices together, you know, we have this whole coaching and support program, and this has actually definitely been an element of learning, right? Learning how to develop a service is a very different skill set. Um, and that's thinking through, you know, what is the patient experience, really understanding that and really talking to people to understand, you know, what are the points that we can intervene and where can we meet people where they are versus, you know, forcing them to jump through a lot of hoops uh, like they do in the medical system. Um, so, yeah, so that's been a that's been an interesting thing. We're currently, you know, we did our first study. We're currently in the middle of a couple of other studies. The team has grown from when I joined in January. So the acquisition was funny because the acquisition was a four person company acquiring a two person company. Um, and by two people, I mean, it was me working on it and, and you know, Levi helping out where he could. And so when I joined, you know, it, I was one of five people in January 2020. Um, we're at 30 now, which is great. Um, and we've been able to grow the team. And a lot of the stuff that I've learned in the past year has been like, how do you effectively manage a project that's getting more and more complicated? Um, and also, how do you build a really supportive and collaborative team culture? You know, down the, when you think about your quality of life as you work, um, it's so important, the people that you work next to every day. Um, or you know the people that you see on virtually on meetings every day. Um, it is so important to have a good team with you, and that has been so critical uh, to one, you know, my happiness at work, but also having people who are committed and working together. Um, and so that's something that I would say, especially you know, lessons learned, critical to have. Um, and you know, I won't go too much into the economics of this, but. You know, a nice thing here is that I didn't have to develop any of these slides. Like, I have a whole commercial team and a whole marketing team um, and a finance team that are putting together all of these things. So, like, definitely also, if you're thinking about starting a startup, like, find people who are good at the things that you're not good at and find people who enjoy doing the things that you don't want to do. Because if you had to do this yourself, it would not get done or it would not get done well. And so, you know, that's that's one of the other things that I will leave you with is like find good people to work with and find people with a diverse skill set because a whole team of engineers is not a good not a good team composition um and so you have to find people who enjoy different things and who work differently from you um and that that is a way to build a really strong team if you can kind of agree and and interact with each other with respect as human beings and then have skill sets that complement each other um, yeah, so I am going to actually exit this um, and pop the other slides back on. Uh, all right, and I know, uh, Yash, do we only have 10 minutes left? Oh, I think you're muted. If you want to go a little further, it's okay, but we do have a couple questions from the audience. If you 
Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I can go a little bit longer. Um, actually, I'll just stop sharing. Um, so I'm happy to be on video. Yeah, if, if there are questions, uh, please lob them over. I can stay a little bit longer as well. Perfect. So uh, I guess this is a little bit of a transition. Thank you so much for leading us through your experience, Alan. Um, I'm sure we've all learned a lot about what it takes to you know, found a startup and you know areas of uh, growing importance in, in the healthcare industry. Uh, so starting with our first question, um, we have one from Sarah from Malaysia. Uh, was it mm -hmm. hard getting into the medical field with an art or engineering background? Uh, yes, and that's something where having good advisors really comes in handy. Um, you know, we didn't know anything about healthcare, and actually, what I'll what I'll say is. 90% of the issues in healthcare that you see right now are not technology problems. They are regulatory challenges, they're logistics challenges, they're operational challenges. It's probably not, you know, let me build an, a little widget or let me build a software that's going to fix everything. It's a lot more of it is on, you have to understand how hospitals are run, how payers and insurance companies are run. And this is, granted, this is going, this is a little bit, um, U.S. centric, uh, just in our view, and and the U.S. is particular, particularly dysfunctional healthcare system. Um, but I would say, you know, even in the medical device field, you can like there's there's good stuff you can do with engineering, but it always helps to have um, someone medical vouching for you. Whether that's finding a doctor that you're partnering with who can be an advisor on your team or who might bring you actually problems that they're seeing in the, you know, in their practice, um, or you might bring, you know, you might bring in uh, an advisor who understands really like that hospital business model, or you might bring a researcher who has identified something really novel that can help um, and working with them to kind of implement solutions. So that's something where you can re rely on experts. Um, and especially, you know, we, we ran into this frequently where they were like, well, you know, you're college students or we we made a pitch presentation. And after the presentation, you know, one of the investors came and was like, well, so how old are you anyway? And I was like, that's not a question that you would ask other presenters. And, you know, it's not, it definitely speaks to how they thought about us. Um, and so, you know, it's something where if you can supplement that knowledge and experience gap with um, other folks that can bring in that expertise and people who, you know, if you run into roadblocks, you can ask them those questions and they can and they can widen your perspective as well. That's super important. Okay, that's great to hear. Um, we have another question from Jack from Boston. Um, I think we've touched upon this, but how would you find uh, the right co-founder specifically? Not just the team, but specifically the co-founders. Yeah, um, I'm gonna gear this particularly towards being in school. Keep an eye out for those folks as you're working on like school projects, for example, as you're working on projects for classes, as you're in your extracurriculars, like keep an eye out for those people who are reliable, who are you know who you work well with who you have a good rapport with you don't always want to work with your friends and actually i kind of make a policy to not work with friends um, just because you know if the it can be tough sometimes to separate the friendship from the the business side of things like you need people who you can disagree with productively because it's all well and good when everything's great and you're like okay we're going to split all the shares equally and we're all friends right now the part the part that you have to plan for and what you have to look for is not who do you get along best with when everybody's happy, it's who is who's going to be there with you when things are really terrible. Um, and you need someone who has your back there. And so like, even if you have a really good friend who's like kind of flighty or like not super reliable or a little bit flaky, like it's not a good person to have as your co-founder. Um, so you know, keep an eye out for those people in your classes. And if you see those people who are like, I really respect that, or this person's really good, um, or, you know, they are a reliable person and, and you get along with them, like, you know, take take the time to get to know them and, and find those people. Um, a lot of times it's like, you know, it might be people in your dorm or people that you meet um, kind of outside 
definitely keep an eye out for those folks in the extracurriculars because if you're only looking at people in your major, you're going to have that issue where you have too much of an overlap in your skill set. Um, you know, because you're you don't need if with a two person startup, you don't need two engineers on it, right? Like you need someone who has that kind of who is willing to do that business side of things. Um, not all engineers want to be in front of, at the head of the company or in front of everybody. Um, so, you know, you have to find people who can do that. That's a very important point. Um, we have another question uh, from Ikram from Morocco. Um, what was the hardest lesson that you had to learn during the, the founding of the startup? Yeah, the hardest lesson. Um, one is like not everybody cares about the things that you do, um, like the same things that you do. So it's like, you know, you can for us, like we were telling the story for scoliosis patients and it felt like there was something really impactful there. Um, but, you know, realizing that the investors get hundreds of pitches a week. And they get everybody talking about these giant problems and how terrible it is and how they're going to fix them. And so it's, you know, it's not necessarily personal, but it's sort of like you are not special. Um, and knowing that and then saying like, OK, you know, they're predisposed to think that we're not special. So we are we just have to be really good and we have to show the evidence and we have to do the work. And so for me, you know, the, the biggest lesson to learn was that traction is like traction. Um, and results can trump almost anything. They can trump a really, like I have seen terrible pitches, like the slide decks are super ugly. Um, they, the person who's giving the pitch is stuttering, they're not a good presenter, but their company has traction and they get funded because of it, because they've been able to demonstrate results. And the problem is, or not the problem, but the just, you know, if you start a startup right out of college, you have no dem uh, demonstrated results and you have no work history and so what's you know you're always going to be kind of back on, on your back foot in that in that case you're always going to be one step behind because what investors are looking for is they're looking for a track record and if if you have you know it's so much easier to raise money as a second time entrepreneur actually um you know it's so much easier to raise money if you've already done it before and uh, if you have already, you know, started a company or, or run a product, or if you've worked your way up pretty high in another in a bigger organization, like they know that okay, this person is clearly skilled and reliable, and you know, there's an external way to validate that. Um, fresh out of college, you don't have any of that, and so you are going to have to prove it by showing results. And not everybody's, you know, the the schools, depending on what school you're in, you might get resources or you might have student specific resources to do that, but those resources are pretty light. And so you really have to take the time to say, what can I do to demonstrate early traction as early as possible? Also a very important point. <laughs> um, one more question from Simone. Um, how do you balance questioning if you have the right solution uh, and the self-doubt or the will to uh, persevere? Yeah, um, that's I think that's a that's a tough one because there's there's a tendency to say, OK, we're going to like we think we have the right thing. And I would say for me, I would always I always rely on that patient feedback or that user feedback that has been so critical for us um, because it all comes down to like, do we think we are helping solve a problem for someone and for me a lot of it is about empathy and around improving the lives of the people around me um, and so to me it's like did we improve you know did we improve their lives uh, is this solving a problem will it improve people's lives in the future um, and that is that has been so critical for us to say you know when we get that direct feedback when we start to build something and we get that feedback uh, that helps us ground what we're doing but you have to be really open. You can't, there's a tendency to also say like, oh, I've invested so much time. And then you like don't want to listen to the negative feedback. Um, you have to be really clear eyed about it. You can't delude yourself because that's going to, you know, that's going to create a huge blind spot for you in the future. So you have to, the flip side of that is like being confident because you're listening to users, but like you have to really listen to them. Um, and then, you know, you can point to that. So you can, and when people, 
like when people question you about it, you can say, you know, don't take it from me. Here's what our users are saying. And here's what the people, you know, the decision makers are saying. And here's what, you know, here's what's important there. You do have to use a little bit of kind of your gut, but your your gut is supported by the research and the work that you put into really understanding that whole market and, and the whole ecosystem that you're working within. Uh, and then one last question. Um, how do you overcome problems with cash flow, specifically in a biomedical startup or startups in general? Yeah, uh, this is why I, when people are, thinking about doing medical device startups, um, I, you just, you're going to have to do a lot more work. Um, and I love devices and medical devices is like, it's a, it's a love of mine, but you know, our company, we built this flip nebula. We started off building this nebulizer and we've added Bluetooth and all of that. And we're probably going to shut it down because keeping a device company going is so difficult. And, you know, because we've added on these, these software and the services and we've started building up that capacity, like you just look at the contrast between how many people you're able to help with that and uh, the cost of providing that care. And devices are expensive. They have a really high upfront cost. Um, they always run into issues. And then the cost of like main, maintaining, you know, FDA registration and the record keeping and complaint handling, providing customer support for devices. That's not to say that you shouldn't do it, but it is a whole rabbit hole to get into. And if you want to do medical devices, like, you know, I will, I am happy to sit down with you and say like, here are all the things that you'd be thinking about and here are all the pitfalls that you need to avoid. And that's not to say that you shouldn't do it, but just that the it is a, a uniquely difficult market. Um, cash flow wise, it's uh, the nice thing about medical devices, though, is that there is usually um, a good amount of grant funding available. So you can look at kind of government grants. You can look at world, you know, world health or nonprofit grants. Um, you know, you can see uh, you can see that people invest in it in a way that you don't need to take investor money necessarily. And so, you know, you can get some of those grants and that can solve some of the early cash flow issues and, and early prototyping. Um, but I would say, you know, like I said previously, it's like make your prototyping rounds small because jumping into manufacturing without that experience um, will put you immediately into hot water. Um, so as you're building, like do what you can with your own team internally, build as much as you can, even if you have to invest more, um, you know, invest more of your own time and labor into it. Or if you have to, if you're kind of committing to a higher upfront cost, you know, if you're making 200 of something, but you're not making any more than that, you know, that might be expensive to make those 200 and you do get price breaks when you actually make your injection mold, but like 10 towards doing those runs and getting as much data as you can to make sure that your design is the right thing to mass produce because you can't unmass produce something. Um, and if you make a change once you've done that, that money is all pretty much just gone. And so you want to be really careful about that. So as an engineer, if you have those skills, you are actually way ahead of the pack. Um, and you can use and apply those skills and like teach yourself as much as you can there to make that possible. And then bring on experts in the regulatory side of things, on the manufacturing side of things, uh, who can help you navigate that process. Oh, you are muted again. It's a tough one. Okay, well, thank you, Ellen. Um, mm -hmm. I think we are reaching the end of our time for the session. Uh, so mm -hmm. to everyone listening, thank you for being a great audience. And I hope you've enjoyed this amazing presentation. Uh, you can now head on over to the next session where you'll hear about the development of uh, low-cost ventilator technology during the COVID pandemic in a talk given by uh, Professor Mark Thompson of the University of Oxford. Uh, you can also go on to the wonder.me link uh, to meet and network with students who've been attending this talk or the conference in general. And I've put both links in the chat as well as the Q&A uh, section. So once again, a, a big thank you to Ellen and the audience, and I hope you all have a Great rest of the day. Awesome. Thanks for having me.